Yamar Joba, and welcome to the History of Sacardvelo, Georgia. I'm your host, Roberto, and this is episode 10, the second coming of Farnavaz, Mirvan, and Arshak. Today, we're going to discuss the 7th, 8th, and 9th kings of Kartli, that being Farnavaz II, Mirvan II, and Arshak II, hence the second coming. Also, this will be a huge milestone for us, as we are now entering the common era. Goodbye BC, hello AD. Most of our information about our kings comes from the Kartli Sohorvieva, aka the Georgian Chronicles, aka the life of Kartli if you actually translate it. If you've been keeping up, of course. We also have some more sources outside of that with some books. As always, if you want to see the sources that we use, feel free to check the episodes page on the website and the bibliography of that episode will be available. I would like to give thanks to listener Sean G. from Canada for donating the A Book of Wisdom and Lies by Orbeliani to the show. You are fantastic, and thank you for providing more wonderful stories to the show. We'll cover Orbeliani and his stories as we get closer to the 17th and 18th centuries, or sooner. You'll never know unless you keep listening. On a more personal note, I started a new job, and while I'm currently loving it so far, it's going to require me to start releasing on Saturdays to give myself enough time during the week to write and edit these scripts and recordings. I've also moved cross-country, so the weather is lovely up north here. We last left off with the end of the Mithridatic Wars, and the death of King Artag of Kartli. The year is now 63 BC, and Farnavaz II has ascended the throne. Little is known about his namesake, but he seems to be held in high regard by the sources for some reason. So, let's see if he lives up to his namesake that we know nothing about, shall we? Farnavaz II ruled from 63 BC to 30 BC. You could say that his rule was relatively peaceful for at least the first 20 years. In those 20 years, trouble was brewing between the Parthians, the Armenians, and the Romans. Because when is it ever not brewing? Keep that in mind as we skip ahead to 53 BC. The first triumvirate between Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus had just ended. This being due to Crassus having gone to fight the Parthians and get himself soundly defeated and killed. This caused the Armenians to take sides against their Roman overlords and ally themselves with the Parthians. Side note, not only was Crassus defeated and later killed after surrendering, his body was treated in various humiliating ways, depending on whom you ask. Some say molten gold was poured in his corpse's mouth to show the futility of greed, very Game of Thrones-like, while, if you believe Plutarch, his head was used as an improvised prop in a performance of Euripides' Bacchae at the Armenian court, forcing the actors to work around the fact that someone just threw the head of your greatest enemy's general on stage. I'd freak out. Also, more of a side note, Euripides wrote Medea, so hey, another connection there. Anyways, the Romans would have been upset about this if it wasn't for the fact that they were distracted with their own problems as per usual. By 40 BC, things still remained quiet in Kartli, and the Parthians, sensing the Romans' distraction with their civil war, took this opportunity to go into Anatolia and take a whole bunch of Roman land. This, the Romans noticed. Of course, it takes some time to retaliate because, while the first triumvirate was gone, the second triumvirate was going strong. In 36 BC, Mark Antony, and if we wouldn't get flagged for copyright music on YouTube, I'd play some Spanish music by Mark Antony, uh, decided to finally retaliate against these incursions, believing that the Transcaucasian nations would provide the support they had promised the Romans. Honestly, why would you believe this if you haven't maintained a relationship in over 20 years? As far as we know, of course, not wanting to spend his time dealing with the Caucasians, Mark Antony decided to send Canidius Crassus to attack Farnavaz II. These attacks proved too much for the King of Kartli, and he quickly returned to being an ally of the Romans against King Zober of the Caucasian Albanians, who also quickly submitted. I'd like to mention that the Kartlis Horrieba doesn't mention this defeat at all, but when do chronicles ever say things that went bad for a king? I mean, only if it's about the next king, but 
that's a tangent on its own. This kind of reminds me of when Mike Duncan kept talking about how George Washington was known for being excellent at retreating. I know it literally won the American War of Independence, but isn't it a little embarrassing to be known for being really good at running away? You know, in the words of Monty Python, run away! Now, I'd like to take this time to mention that our plethora of Roman sources, and by that I mean they're slim to none available because I'd lied last episode. Sorry about that, y'all. I just got excited about the Romans. Also mentioned that the reason Crassus entered the Caucasian region is because Cartley may have joined in opposing Mark Antony with the Armenians. This, of course, happens near the end of the reign of Farnavaz II. Honestly, this kind of reminds me of one of those things people like justifying doing something stupid by saying, I don't need to explain the reasons why, because this is all common knowledge. No, no, it's not common knowledge. Anyways, let me do the too long, didn't read version of another theory of why the Romans returned to the region. Basically, Mark Antony was priming for an attack against the Parthians because he wanted to put Monaesis as king of Parthia instead of having Phraates as the king, in order to help Roman ambitions, of course. Due to the lack of time in planning and the campaign being launched in winter, it can be assumed that Monaesis had fled to Antony from Parthia, essentially flailing his arms around in a crazy manner saying, It's now or never. Get me my throne. Crassus was probably sent ahead to check on the Caucasian allies to see if they would respond by aiding the Romans, and upon arriving, probably found them aggressive and needing to be put in their place, hence them teaming up to fight the Albanians and getting the region nice and secure under a Roman alliance. This is where I'd like to mention that even though the Iberians and Albanians were allies during the Mithridatic Wars, their relationship most of the time is akin to that of England and France, in which they will always try to attack each other. Crassus was able to get through the territory quickly with minimal combat because he was just regaining the Caucasian support instead of attempting to conquer them. This aids Mark Antony's Parthian campaign well, since it allows him to have logistic lines from the Black Sea all the way to the Parthian borders. And the TL, DR, ends here, because this is not Mike Duncan's or Trevor Culley's show, but the history of Rome and the history of Persia are great, so check them out. Remember, we're here for Kartli and Igrisi, or Iberian Colchis. Skipping more time, because we literally have nothing else written, we find ourselves in 31 BC at the Battle of Actium. We're not interested in what happened during the battle, but more so the result of the battle. With Mark Antony's defeat, most Caucasian kings sent envoys to Rome to seek Octavian's friendship. We have no clue when this happened, but due to the closeness of the date at 30 BC, it may be Mervan II or Farnavaz II. But as I said, this envoy trip has no dates, so it's just a flip of the coin. So, how does Mirvan II come into power in 30 BC? Well, we should probably talk about Farnavaz II and his downfall. First off, Farnavaz II is nothing like his namesake. The Georgian chroniclers describe him as a man of sickly constitution. Family-wise, he had a single daughter and no male heir. As most of you will know, no male heirs tends to be a problem when you're a king. So, to remedy this, he adopted a descendant of Kuji of Colchis named Kartam to be his son. And in a classic fashion, he married that son to his daughter. I mean, they're all technically still blood related, but trust me, the incest is only getting started. Wait till you see the next king. Well, not really incest, but it's lots of issues. Kartam did what he had to do, and with this unnamed daughter, Farnavaz II is now going to have a baby. Wait till you see who that baby is. Anyways, after this adoption, Kartam became the heir of Kartli. The people of Kartli rejoiced because they rather liked having a Farnavazid king in power, especially if they're related to the actual Farnavaz. At this point, everyone is. I can't believe it's only been 250 plus years since Farnavaz. However, even with the throne secured, the best laid plans are often put to waste. Because behold, the one-year-old son of King Parnajam has now returned for his birthright. The sound of war reverberates through the mountains and valleys as Mirvan is seen at the head of his Persian army. This is a guy we have dates for because he was a year old when his dad died. So, Mirvan II is a 60 year old, described by the sources as a valiant man and a fearless fighter tried in battle multiple times against the Turks and Arabs. Wait, were they even around at the time? Get your act together, chroniclers. Having gathered as strong an army as he could in Persia, 
Mirvan set for Kartli. He sent envoys to the Aristavis of Kartli, saying, quote, Remember the love of my grandfather, Mirvan, and the good he did for you. And though my father introduced an alien faith, you must still remember his good deeds. My father was justly killed, for he did not keep your father's faith. And now let the care and fear related to the death of my father leave your hearts. For on account of apostasy, fathers kill their children and brothers, and nobody tries to avenge those murdered for rejection of their faith. I am a descendant of your kings, the Farnabazids, and though I have been brought up among the Persians, I profess the faith of your fathers. I trust in gods, the patrons of Kartli, and setting my hopes upon them, I am going to regain my homeland. Now receive glory and good from me." End quote. Mirvan spoke, but none of the Aristavis listened or even joined him as they preferred Farnabas II, which makes sense, he is already on the throne. Farnabas II had to act quickly and gathered all his troops throughout Kartli, and even caught upon his Armenian allies. He met with Mirvan's forces at the fortress of Hunani, which he kept to his rear. Mirvan came to the Berduji River, and battle soon commenced. Of course, in classic Greek storytelling fashion, they decided to avoid the massive set-piece battle and instead have a one-on-one, -on -one, where they would choose champions to fight each other. Mirvan, however, kept rolling nat 20s and killed 13 Iberians and Armenians over the month in which they fought, and no one was able to beat him. That is a strong 60-year-old. Farnabaz, due to his sickly constitution, was unable to participate in the festivities of course, now being mad at losing so many strong fighters to Mirvan, Farnavaz decided to bring in his troops and move against Mirvan. Mirvan met him head on, and a fierce battle took place, with countless dead on both sides. But soon enough, the dust cloud settled, and two bodies were found on the ground, that of Farnavaz II and his heir, Kartam. Mirvan and the Persians have stolen the day. Now with Farnavaz dead, Mirvan entered Kartli and took it for himself promising the Aristavis of Kartli their safety as long as they left their fortresses. This was not the only possession of Farnavaz's that he took. He also forced Farnavaz's widow into a marriage, as she was from the Arshakid family from Samshvilde, relating her to the Armenians. With this act, he ascended the throne. In the meantime, Farnavaz's pregnant daughter fled to Armenia and birthed a son she named Adarki and raised him there. Remember that name. Mirvan II reigned from 30 BC to 20 BC and had a son with Farnavaz's wife named Arshak II. His entry in the Kartlis Horeba is short and sweet. He reigned quietly for a short time. After his death, his son Arshak came to the throne. This is going to be something that reoccurs in the future, our one to two sentence entries. Some of the sources also say that Kartli and Rome had become quite close by 20 BC thanks to Mirvan's frequent collaborations with them, but that's at the end of Mirvan's rule, so it may be Arshak, it may be Mirvan, we have no clue. But by the end of the first century BC, which we are nearing, Kartli was free from the Roman yoke, was no longer paying them taxes, and was even seen as an ally by Augustus. Score. Mirvan II soon died, he was pretty old, and was succeeded by his son Arshak II. However, away from the valleys of Kartli, Trouble was brewing for the Armenians, and in 20 BC, Augustus sent the future princeps Tiberius to the Caucasus under best boy Agrippa to install Tigranes III, Tigranes the Great's grandson, in place of his murdered brother Artaxis, who was a Parthian ally. The king of Kartli, either Mirvan or Arshak II, could have only been paying close attention to these negotiations due to the proximity of these nations to their border. Augustus was like Don Corleone. He always sought friendship with people to strengthen his hands against his enemies, who, in Augustus's case, were the Parthians. Armenia will become a ground for dispute between Rome and Parthia, setting up Kartli in a good position for a strong and wise king to conquer. Arshak II ruled from 20 BC to 1 AD. Turn off the dating systems, y'all. It's all forward from here. So, it didn't take more than a generation for Mirvan's throne to disappear, because remember Adarki? Well, he grew up into a man and will be returning. Arshak II is descended from Arshak I through his mother's side and through Farnabaz I on his father's side. In the classic style of the Kartlis Horeba, 
The biggest thing of note he did as king was build more things, namely the town of Necrisi today and for reinforcing the fortress at Uplisige. He is also described to us by the chroniclers. This is a rare occurrence, so enjoy this while it lasts. His description, he's strong and tall. I know quite a few people in which that's all the information they need about to like him. Anyways, jokes aside, that's all we get about his reign because the chroniclers care much more about Parsman the first. In some sources, he'll be Adarchy, but to us and the Georgians, his name is Parsman. Parsman is descended from Farnavaz the second, which comes from the Armenian Farnavazid line, otherwise known as the Arshakids, while Mirvan the second comes from the Persian Farnavazid line, known as the Nebrotids. So, the Persian and Armenians are fighting for the throne of Kartli, despite the fact that they're both Georgian in the end. What else is new? Parsman, as I mentioned earlier in this episode, fled with his mother to Armenia when Farnavaz II died, and his father died in battle against Smirvan 30 years ago. Parsman is described as being in good health, and he's a big boy who proves himself in battle multiple times when he fought the Armenian military against the Assyrians. Of course, fame wasn't enough, and he knew the throne of Kartli was his by right. He appealed to the king of Armenia, Tigranes IV, or Ario Barzanus II, we don't know which was king at the time, so we're guessing between these two guys. The king of Armenia agreed, and soon enough, Parsman was marching out against Arshak, king of Kartli, who is also his uncle. Now, I need to explain something because I was confused, and I don't want you guys to be confused. Mirvan II forced Farnavaz II's wife to marry him, and he had a kid with her named Arshak II, because Farnavaz II already had a daughter who fled to Armenia, his unnamed wife was forced to birth the current king of Kartli for Mirvan II, so everyone's related and fighting for the same throne. I literally had to stop and think about this because I got confused. I made a family tree, but I don't like how it looks, so I'll post one up on the website soon. Get ready for a list of unnamed women on that family tree because who cares about them, right? Okay, tangent, because this really ticked me off. And I'm tired of running into this issue. If the woman is important enough to be mentioned because she married somebody, why can't you mention her name? Sources, we rely on you for all the information we have. I need to know who marries who, and not just you saying his daughter married so-and-so, and not telling us who she is. Women matter just as much as the men do, and you're completely ignoring their role in court. I can't wait for Queen Tamar. Tangent over. Arshak II gathered his Aristavi, his Persian forces, and came to meet Parsman in battle at Trialeti, where they camped close to each other. Arshak II challenged Parsman to a fight, and Parsman agreed. Remember, these are strong boys, so they got a fight. Donning his armor, Parsman mounted his horse and told his troops to, quote, cover my rear and be afraid of nothing, end quote. Arshak II also armed himself and spoke to his men. You can really see who the chroniclers like by the dialogue that they give people. Battle cries filled the air, and they rushed to each other and struck each other with their spears, but were unable to pierce through each other's armor. Their spears broke, and they quickly switched to their maces and fought with those. If this were a Dungeon and Dragons game, I'd honestly say they were making their attack rolls and barely rolling ones for their damage dice, because they were hitting each other, but not doing much or any massive damage to each other. As they hit each other, the mace sounded like an hammer hitting an anvil, and their battle cries roared like thunder in the sky. However, they were unable to overpower each other. They soon became tired and agreed to retreat to their camps to rest. You know, why can't wars be fought like this normally? There's a part in the novel All Quiet on the Western Front where the soldiers joke that all the generals in the world should just fight each other with clubs instead of dragging the common people into their stupid conflicts. And it didn't occur to me until just now that this was a pretty popular trope in historical literature. Just two rulers duking it out to see who wins and the normal soldiers just acting like cheerleaders. Anyways, seeing how an up close and personal battle wasn't doing anything to finish the fight, Parsman and Arshak agreed to have a long distance battle. They took their bows and began shooting at each other. Yes, great idea if you want to live. This literally depends on who's the better shot. Despite all the low rolls, someone managed to finally get a nat 20, and that was Parsman. His arrow pierced through Arshak II's armor and struck him in the chest. Arshak II fell dead from his horse. Now that his opponent had fallen in battle, pun intended, Parsman turned over to his Armenian troops and ordered them to not fight the Iberians as he is now king. The Armenians obeyed him. 
Parsban the first then approached the Iberians and in a loud and booming voice appealed to the Iberians by saying how he is also descended from Farnavaz and other kings of Kartli, and his fortune in life granted him their fair kingdom, especially as he did not allow the Armenians to attack them. Recall from episode 7 that the Aristavis of Kartli like to have strong rulers that can put them in check from time to time. This show of strength and legitimacy was good enough for the Iberians, who responded by stating that he is the best of the Farnavazids, and since Archak II died airless, he is now the king of Kartli. They dismounted from their horses, paid homage to Parzman and the Armenians, Iberians, and even the Persians from Rani mingled and partied with each other, celebrating Parzman's rise to the throne, and the crown was removed from Archak II's corpse and placed onto his head. They then took him to Metisketa. Firstly, they didn't even bury Arshak. Secondly, Arshak II is dead. Long live Parzman the First, whom we'll cover next episode. Wait, do you hear that? It's time for a Colchis interlude. We last left Colchis in 63 BC under the care of Aristarchos of Colchis, who became its governor. However, things were more than hectic and Colchis suffered through years of instability. As they say in Dune, the spice must flow. But in Colchis's case, chaos must flow. It's all thanks to Mithridates' sixth heir, Pharnicus, and the trouble brewing with the Roman civil war between Caesar and Pompey. And yes, we have to specify which of the many, many Roman civil wars it was. Just saying the Roman civil war is like saying the winter day on which it was snowing, or the Greek myth where Zeus cheats on his wife. It doesn't help narrow things down. Caesar's civil war started in 49 BC and Colchis was forced to support Pompey because they were overseen by Deotar of Paphlagonia, who Pompey put in place. Things changed a year later because the traitorous son of Mithridates VI Eupater, Pharnicus, wanted to reclaim the land his father once had and re-establish the Pontic Empire, so this meant he must take Colchis. And he did. Pharnicus invaded Colchis from the north and attacked Lesser Armenia and Roman-controlled Pontus. However, Caesar was having none of that, and came in, ejected Pharnicus, and stated one of his many famous lines, Winne, Witte, Wiki. I came, I saw, I conquered. This happened after the Battle of Zella in 47 BC, and Pharnicus was killed by his viceroy, Asandros. Caesar left his associate, Mithridates of Pergamum, to rule the area, but that didn't last long, as Asandros came in in 46 BC, and took over Colchis once again. This spelled trouble for Colchis, as it meant their wealth and resources, especially at the Temple of Leucothea, were continuously plundered for use by the rulers. Colchis fell victim to this looting over a 20-year period, while parts of Colchis were ruled by Asandros until his death in 18 BC. After 47 BC, King Polemol of Pontus took central and southern Colchis. Polemol was a civic dynast that Mark Antony put into power and whom Augustus decided was good enough to keep his position. Polemol, however, passed Colchis to his wife Pythodorus as her dowry for a new husband after he died in 8 BC. This essentially gives Colchis its first known queen, and I would love to do a mini episode concerning her. If you guys are interested, reach out and let me know. We don't know much about her, so it'll be a super short episode, and I'd be happy to do one on Polemo and his wife Pythodorus. Also, this is when Colchis finally became rather stable under these two rulers. And that's it for this week. Join us next week as we cover the reign of Parsman I, known occasionally as Parsman the Great, depending on who you talk to, and what the absolute mad lad did in the Caucasian region. Hint, you'll find out in episode 11, the Empire of Cartley. To support us, feel free to look us up on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram as The History of Sacartvelo, Georgia, on Twitter at History underscore Georgia, on her website at historyofsacartvelo.com, or on her email at thehistoryofsacartvelo.georgia at gmail.com. Sacartvelo is spelled S-A-Q-A-R-T-V-E-L-O. If you would be so kind in aiding with purchasing sources, I have a link to the Amazon wishlist in the transcription and on the website, but it's only if you want to. Also, a review on Apple Podcast or your preferred podcast host goes a long way with getting the word out about the show and helping us reach new people to learn about the country of Georgia. Madlaba the Nachfamdis. And thank you for listening to The History of Sakarvelo, Georgia. 
See you next time. Thank you.